Um, this is who I am, and the title of today's message is simply one word, it's secure. Now, secure is really not uh, who I am, but it is an attribute of who God says I am, and because he says who I am, I have security that cannot be taken away, and I want to talk to you about that this morning. Um, I was a little, a little alarmed, some of the stuff that, not alarmed, I guess I knew this already, but it's amazing to me how few people actually understand what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Uh, Barna, the Barna group, as the kids are studying in Prime, released a stat. I can't, help me out for a sec, Tyler, Christine. What was the percentage of people who do not have a worldview, but call, or do not have a Christian worldview, but would still think they're Christians? Ninety-eight percent of people, according to the Barna group, believe that they are Christians, but in fact do not have a biblical worldview. Now. Why that ties into the message today is, I'll, I'll try to explain it to you. Um, as Christine was saying, who I am is not decided by me. It's decided by my creator. And a chair is a chair by design, by development, by creation. That, that's what the, its identity is. It is, a, it is a tool for sitting on. And it can also be made into art, and it can also be made to be some different things. But either way, its purpose and its, its identity, its reality is defined by the one who gets to set that identity. So um, there's something really smart that Prime taught our kids, which I, I just probably didn't have the words for at this point to teach my, my own children. But it's simply this. You can either choose your worldview or it will happen to you. You can either choose your worldview or it's, it's going to happen to you. You are going to end up with a worldview. Where it's a problem for us as those who follow Jesus is if we accept a worldview that is not biblical in nature, then who are you in nature? Well, you are what the Bible defines as human nature. And human nature is carnal nature. Human nature is not the divine nature. Human nature is the warped effects of sin in the lives of people. Very, very important that we understand as a part of who we are, our identity in Christ needs to be that we reflect God's view of this world, needs to be that we reflect Jesus, the Holy Spirit's view of this world. If you find yourself being polarized these days by political backtalk so that you are dehumanizing a human being, let me tell you something, you are not in the correct worldview. And by the way, I find more people outside of the church doing that than inside of the church. But I want to challenge you as we continue this morning. What is, your, what is your worldview? Have you thought about it? Have you thought about what a biblical worldview is even? Or are you simply going to define yourself by what other peoples or other entities put on the shelf as your options to choose from? I choose a biblical worldview because the biblical worldview that God has given in his word not only defines how I should love the world around me, but it, de it defines for me who I am and why I'm built to do exactly that. So let's get started this morning. What is it that threatens your peace? What is it that threatens your security right now in this world? Uh, in your mind, in your spirit, in your physical body, because all three of those things are, are realities. What's keeping you up at night? What is, what is causing you to medicate with whatever your choice of medication might be, food, alcohol, uh, drugs. Uh, I, don't, I don't know, what do, what do we do? What are these things that are threatening our security? I want us to understand this morning that who I am in Christ is unaffected by all of the things in this world that could make me insecure. Now that's a pretty bold statement. Does that mean that Pastor Trav does not struggle with insecurity? Oh no, I struggle with insecurity just like everybody else. For as long as the carnal man is in existence in who I am, I'm going to have to put him to death every day, and I'm going to have to take up my cross and follow Jesus. That's why it says what it says. But as we mature, as we become a little bit more like Jesus, hopefully every day of our lives, we actually begin to see ourselves in a different light than we used to. We actually begin to see ourselves according to a biblical worldview, according to God's view of who we really are because of Jesus. So let's run through a few of these this morning. And I promise by the end of today, I want to leave you with a tool that will help you move through some of your anxiety. Some of your issues, your insecurity that you're facing and who you are in Christ. Romans chapter 8, verses 1 to 4. Therefore, there is now no condemnation. Everyone say, no condemnation. 
for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. Sorry. You know the most dangerous thing you can do right now? Is pop a halt in your mouth and pull your mask up. You will go blind instantly. Do not do it while you're driving. Uh, you, will, you will get in a wreck because you will not be able to see. Try it if you want to. Um, sorry, interrupted the word of God because that Halls was interrupting me trying to read the word of God. Uh, the spirit who gives life has set you free. Everyone say, set me free. From the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh. That means he condemned Jesus. Everyone say those words. That means he condemned Jesus instead of me. Come on, let, let, that, let, that, let that water sink into the dirt of your soul this morning. So vital for you to understand who you are because of Jesus and what he's done. So he condemned sin, in the, condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us. Everyone say fully met. These are important words in the scripture. Who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. So if I could just paraphrase this for you, I am removed from the reach of condemnation. Is there still condemnation in this world? Yes, there is. There is condemnation everywhere. Well, the church isn't wearing masks. The church should be wearing masks. I can't believe another church fell to the mask scam. Like, what are we supposed to do? By the way, the reason why I preach and don't wear a mask is because I assume there are people who need to see my lips moving to understand what I'm saying. Because you know what? I have perfect hearing. I, I had a hearing test done not long ago. My hearing is like way up there, 98th, 99th percentile of what it could possibly be. I have excellent hearing. And I find that in a room with people with ambient noise, I have to see your mouth. And so I think it's a high value for us as a church to make sure people can see our faces when we communicate. And so I justify not wearing a mask. And I'm sorry if that's not good enough for you. I'm not sorry, actually, at all. I still love you, though. And those of you who think that if we wear a mask, somehow you're worshiping Satan, you're wrong. You're wrong. Here's the thing. We will stop doing what our city, what our province, what our country says. We will stop cooperating with them when they tell us we have to sin. That's it. Like, it'll be like, bow down to this idol. We'll be like, no. We're going we're gonna to take Shadrach, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in that moment. We will not bow to your idol. Well, we're going to throw you in the fire. Well, fine. We're still not going to bow. Okay. Anyways, I'm sorry, I've, I've, I haven't digressed. I just took a small trail off to the right or left. Um, so we are moved from the reach of condemnation. That does not mean you won't feel condemnation. It means that you need to know who you are so that when condemnation comes your way, you realize it actually has no power over you. Yes. Condemn. I think some people believe that when you become a follower of Jesus, the weather will always be good. And if suddenly you get rained on, something's wrong with your faith. Maybe that's not a great analogy, but I see people living this way. And instead of just enjoying the fact that it needed to rain, because you see, in this world, there are things that are condemnable. Justice demands that some things be condemned. What you need to understand is that God condemned Jesus in your place so that the requirement of the law would be fully met. Okay? So important. So, as a result, I have now the opportunity to live according to the Spirit, not the flesh. Romans 8, 28. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love Him. This is something you probably hear me say a couple times a month at least. I really love this verse. But I really dislike when people say, well, God works all things together for good. Nope, that's not what the Bible says. God is working all things together for the good of those who love him and who have been called according to his purpose. That last part is at least as important as the first part. 
You see, our identity it will always be carnal until we move into the identity of Jesus. You can't change outside of that. Try as you might, you will not change to be more like Jesus until you bend your will to Jesus. So I know what he is, I know that what he is doing is always going to be better than what I can actually see. There's a verse that says we walk by faith, not by sight. And, and this is kind of in the same line. Whatever you see, you need to remember that the Father who loves you, who called you by name, who built you for whatever circumstance you're facing, he designed you intimately for your marriage. He designed you intimately and perfectly for raising your kids. You know that he even designed your kids to work well with you? The reason it's not working well is because you're doing some things wrong. <laughs> Go figure, right? We, we do figure this out as we get older. But what we need to know is that we're not walking by what we see, but we're walking in faith. In faith in what? In faith that God is going to be faithful to every promise he ever made for our lives. And so if his promises, every one of them are yes and amen, which is what the scripture teaches, then I know that when he says he's going to work all things for the good of those who love him and who have been called according to his purposes. Well, I know that I love him and I know that I'm called. So I know he's working all things together for my good. And my good is not beginning and or ending in this life, just so you know. Romans 8, 31 to 39. This is a big chunk of scripture, but it is so worth reading the entire thing. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Um, I had to laugh when uh, our friends over at Victory Church this last week, had, or two weeks ago, had a bit of a uh, COVID thing happen. And uh, I, I was reading in their social media, and this one fella uh, decided it was his chance to sit in the seat of the scoffer and the mocker, and literally saying things like, oh, where's your God now? I'm like, dude, that's so old. I mean, that's what Goliath said to the armies of Israel. Come on, this is, that is an old tactic. And how come God's not delivering you? I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. As far as I can see, God is delivering 99.8% of people who get COVID. Somebody say amen. God is delivering by the sustained power of his word all those who get COVID except for 0 0.02, 0 0.2, whatever it is. And some of those people, are just, they're, they're just up there. And that's, I, I love those people too. We all love those people. But God designed your body with an immune system that is so complex and so miraculous and so ingenious that the human mind cannot figure out how to help it. And strangely enough, it doesn't seem to need help right now. God is for us. So who can be against us? Do you know that when your body defeats a bug, it's because God is for you, not against you? It's because it's God is for you, not against you. If you could somehow remove yourself from everyday life and look down on everything that's going around you, I think we would all stand in amazement at what God is actively doing by his, by his will, his perfect will, his power. There's an interesting nuance of that word, actually, even by his preferred will. God is for us. Who can be against us? It means so much more than we give it credit for. Then it goes on to say, he, did not, he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will we not also along with him graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us then from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? And as it is written, for all day long, or for your sake, we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors. Through him who loved us. For I am convinced. Somebody say, I'm convinced. For I'm convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels or demons, neither the present nor the future, nor powers, 
nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. I want you to become convinced of this. I think sometimes we think convincing is a bad thing. But I want you to understand that convincing is a natural thing. And I I think for some reason we think, well, someone convinced me. And, and, and so we think that it's a manipulation of sorts at times, but that's not what it is. Uh, to become convinced, to stay convinced, uh, the Greek word for this is piatho, and it comes from the root of pistis, which is faith, and then the word to persuade. Piatho is to be, uh, is to, sorry, to have faith by persuasion. That's what this word convinced is trying to to grasp for us. To be persuaded of what is trustworthy. I'm convinced that it's a good idea to at least slow down if I'm going to blow through a red light. Why am I convinced of that? Well, because logic dictates that someone's probably coming through on a green. Right? So so, so, so that's convinced. I'm convinced because it's trustworthy, that light, typically. It's trustworthy. Um, it's, it's this, it's the Lord persuades the yielded believer to be confident in his preferred will. As an example from a, from a place in Galatians, from Galatians 5, 10, 2 Timothy 1, 2, 1, 12. See, piatho involves obedience, but it is properly the result of God's persuasion. So there is, in being convinced, there is a bending of your will and there's the active persuasion of God taking place. I just think that's such a profound reality to live in. That God is wooing me, calling me, persuading me to trust Him. Taste and see that I'm good. In all things, at all times. So that I can be convinced that nothing can separate me from His love for me. Again, I've been to more than one funeral where someone has died without Jesus. And the preacher glosses glosses over, glazes over. Oh, we're convinced that nothing can separate us from the love of God. No, your fallen nature and your sin has already separated you from the love of God. And what Jesus does is invites you to come back to the love of God. 2 Corinthians 1, 21 and 22. Now, it is God who makes both us and you stand firm in Christ. Who makes you stand firm in Christ? What God does. If you'll read his word and let it bring understanding to your soul. God makes both us and you stand firm in Christ. Why? Because he anointed us. He set his seal of ownership upon us and he put his spirit in our hearts as a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. You see, there is a deposit in my life. Who's ever put a deposit down on anything? Who's bought a house recently and had to put that big, nasty deposit with your offer? Isn't that the most fun time buying a house? Because there's that little voice in the back of your head that says, if this falls through, you could lose it all. And it's not cheap. It's, it's, a, it's significant. And God's deposit in your life, guaranteeing what is to come for you in eternity, is not an insignificant deposit. It is deeply meaningful to Him. It is profoundly invaluable to Him. You cannot put a value on the deposit He's made in you because the deposit by itself is enough to guarantee your eternity. Anointed means I walk with authority. His seal over my life cannot be broken. Do you understand the the sovereign authority represented in a seal? It is the decree of the ruler. That envelope, when you sealed that little wax seal that they used to put on things, that little wax seal had tremendous power. And there was only the one person who should be allowed to break that seal. And that was the person who the letter was intended for. The Bible teaches us that Jesus is the... This is great. We have been sealed to the day of Christ Jesus. And the book of Revelation teaches us that Jesus is the only one who's worthy to open the seal, to break the seal. 
And so what you have been sealed with cannot be broken or removed by anyone other than Jesus, who really is the one who put it on you in the first place. You have an unbreakable seal on your life. Your sonship is guaranteed. It's such a beautiful, wonderful reality. And I don't understand how people fall away from that. I don't. So we walk in authority because we're anointed. His seal can't be broken. His spirit resides in me and in you. And my future with him is guaranteed. Colossians 3, 1 to 4. Why do I have security? Since then, you have been raised with Christ. Set your heart on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not earthly things. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. Has anybody died recently? Anybody realize this morning when you got up that you needed to die again? I honestly, most days of my life, this is one of my, one of my early thoughts. Oh, it's another day. God's given me another day in this world and I need to die again. And I don't think a lot of us live that way. But what you need to understand according to Colossians 3, 1 to 4, specifically verse 3. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. You, it's the best deal you're going to get all day, every day. You die to yourself and your life will be hidden with Jesus. It's, it's the best deal. Let me say it one more time for you. Die to yourself every day, and your life is hidden with Jesus in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. You know, I thought of it this, this way. I thought, you know, yeah, the devil's looking for me. I hope so. I hope the devil's trying to get in my way a little bit. Um, and he's looking for me, but my life is hidden with Christ in God. So why would I start making a bunch of noise to let him know where I'm at? You know, I got a good hiding spot. But then I realized that's not actually what it means to be hidden with Christ in God. Uh, Mara, come here. Sweetie, come here. Yes. My daughter, Mara. She really is a stage phenomenon if, if you get her in the right moment. But see, we, I think lots of times we read, oh, my life's hidden with Christ in God. Like, I don't know, like a, like a rough grouse hides in the grass. That's, that's not the imagery that, that God's intending. Th this is what it is. You see, she is now hidden in me. And, that, and guys, that's, that's what, thank you, sweetheart. That's what, God, that's what God is saying to us. He's saying, die, die to yourself and, and hide yourself in me. And that doesn't mean that God makes you a rough grouse hiding in the grass from a coyote that's trying to eat you. It means that God's embrace, his grace, his mercy, the brilliance of who he is envelops you completely into his being. That is why the enemy cannot find you. Man, when God puts us in his breath, there is no shadow of turning in him. Oh, man. We are being enveloped by him. When my children come, would have even been better if she was a little smaller still. Or I guess I could just get bigger. Makes me think of Chinese food for lunch today for some reason. <laughs> Anyways, um, all right. Yeah, so we disappear in, I, my daughter disappears in my arms because I'm bigger than she is. How much more, let me get to the point, how much more will you disappear? How much more will your life be hidden in Christ, in God? It's a size thing. <laughs> it's a size thing. Philippians 1.6, being confident in this, be confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. It's good news. He who began a good work in you. Let me tell you this and, and hear this because those of you who are like me, I'm a recovering procrastinator. <laughs> Let me tell you something. God is not a procrastinator. 
I don't get back to you with my phone call because I'm procrastinating sometimes. But when God doesn't answer your phone call, I want to assure you, it's not because he's procrastinating. It's because he and his perfect will, his preferred will, his persuasion of your life is timing it just right for the moment for him to be your victory. You need to be confident in this. God started something in you. And by God, so appropriate to say it that way, he will see it through. I feel like God abandoned me. That's how you feel. That's because you're living in the wrong identity. You're not living in the who I am is who God says I am reality. Well, I don't feel like, I kind of feel like God is procrastinating. God is not procrastinating. God is working out a perfect plan, a perfect will. And not only that, he's doing it with everybody else at the same time, which is impossible for men. But when you encounter something that is impossible for men, you need to remember that the scripture says with God, all things are possible. Um, uh, yeah, God is not procrastinating. This is my notes say, God is not procrastinating. That's a thing you do, not him. You procrastinate, not God. So, stop judging God by your human deficiencies. You don't have that right. Well, I didn't have a good father. Didn't have a good father in the flesh. How can I trust a heavenly father? Well, that's a fair question when you're broken. It really is. But it's not right that we would try to define the Almighty by a human brokenness. It makes no sense. Uh, Philippians 3.20. Our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. Guys, you're a citizen of heaven. You're a citizen of heaven. So stop with all the other stuff. Remember that your name is written in heaven. It's graven on his hands. There's an old song. My name is graven on his hands. I'm hidden in his heart. You're a citizen of heaven. Maybe you should open your passport once in a while and look at it. Remind yourself. The passport is the Bible for those of you who are slow to catch on today. Um, all right, 2 Timothy 1.7. For God has not given us a spirit of timidity. Everyone say timidity. Just because it requires excellent enunciation to say it. Timidity, but of power and love and discipline. Oh, favorite word, discipline. The verse comes to mind uh, to me as I, was, as I was, actually just this morning as I was finishing this up, I was thinking about this verse. And you know what came to my mind? The Holy Spirit dropped into me. Stop making provision for fear. The verse I'm referring to says, stop making provisions for the lust of the flesh. But I'm thinking about what people are doing right now. And, and guys, people are making provision for fear. That's all they're doing. Well, my Facebook feed says this, and they go down their list, and anxiety builds, and fear builds, and they can't sleep, and then they don't eat right, and then they don't sleep right, and then they stop being intimate with their husband or their wife because they're all stressed out, and they stop loving their kids, and they feel like the family's all falling apart, and, the, and that everything just runs away because they made provision. They fed that monster. Stop feeding that monster. Don't feed intimidation in your life. Know that God says he's given you a spirit of power and love and the discipline with it to live according to his word. I'm just still on it, Pastor Chad. Stop it. Stop being timid. You're more than a conqueror. You are so much more than what you're giving yourself credit for because of Jesus. Man. Last one. 1 John 5, 18. We know that no one who is born of God sins. Okay, just pause for a second. <laughs> but he who is born of God keeps him, and the evil one does not touch him. I am born of God. And therefore, I do not sin. And I know some of you are thinking, that sounds like something like Donald Trump would say. 
and admittedly, it kind of does. But you need to understand that there are, there are two people standing here. Not because I, I have a fractured personality, but there is, there is a Travis who is old nature, and there is a Travis who is the new creation. And the old man, Travis, needs to be crucified regularly with Christ so that the new creation, Travis, can be all that Jesus intended. This is the, this is the choice we live under every day, guys. Take up your cross daily. Take up your cross. Follow Jesus. When you get up tomorrow morning, believe it or not, you are going to make the choice again. And here's the problem. When we started this message, I pointed out that you will either choose your worldview or it will happen to you. It works the same way with the gospel. It works the same way with God's word. You will either embrace God's view of you or you will just let some other view of you happen. Stop it. You are a child of the only wise, the invisible, the almighty ruler of all that is. It'd be great if we all behaved a little more like it. I am born of God. And God keeps me. And the evil one cannot touch me. You know, I think a lot of a lot of people are afraid of the devil. And and there's lots of questions about end times right now. As as your pastor, here's my official position on end times. Would you quit worrying about all those things and try to help your neighbor get a little bit closer to Jesus? Please, that, that, just do that. Because you don't understand, and many wise people don't understand and can't figure it out and argue back and forth endlessly over what it could be. But you know what we don't need to argue about? is the commission Jesus gave us. Go and make disciples, preach the gospel to people, live the gospel for people, baptize people. <sighs> I'm born of God. Here's what that first John chapter five goes on to say. I want to share this with you really quickly as we close today. Worship team, why don't you guys come? Um, we're going to sing one more song this morning as we just give a moment today for the Holy Spirit to speak to us. It goes on to say in verse 19, We know that we are of God and that the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding. Someone say understanding. Understanding so that we may know Him who is true. And we are in Him who is true. In His Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. Little children, guard yourselves from idols. Now, I don't know about you, but that just is one of these passages where there's this thought, and then the last sentence in the thought really goes, bang! It kind of sews the whole big bag of this together. Little children, guard yourself from idols. I want you to understand that your idols in life are what are robbing you of your security. And you see, the problem is when we don't have objective perspective on our own situation, we believe that our idols are harmless. We believe that they're just kind of insignificant and that it's okay. But I want to point out something I find profound to you today. The things you worship, whether you know it or not, those by definition are your idols. And because they are th something that you worship, there is an expression of, that, of worship to that idol. Now, the expression of worship to idols is very different than how human beings are created to worship God. We worship God with thanksgiving, with awe, with wonder, with songs, with singing, shouting, clapping, with dancing. Those are the means by which God says he should be worshipped. But idols are worshipped in different ways. Let's see, the idol of the idol of fear is worshipped by your choice to be in anxiety. 
And you don't think, I know you don't think of that when you're feeling anxious thoughts and when you're being stirred up and you can't sleep. But I want to tell you, you are bowing before an altar of fear when you're living in anxiety. And the anxiety that you're facing or you're experiencing is the expression of worship to that idol. And there is a spiritual power and principality that stands behind that fear because it is a spirit. Because God's word says it is a spirit of fear. And when you live in anxiety or whatever other emotional distress you choose to resign yourself to, that is the expression of worship that gives provision to that idol. And it's not good. It's not safe. It's not healthy. It's not right. And it is not the abundant life that Jesus invited you to come into. Unhealthy relationship is how you worship idols. These things have always been idol worship. In the Old Testament, human sacrifice was a regular form of idol worship. Sleeping with temple prostitutes was an acceptable form of worship to idols. And you need to understand that whatever act you do in your life, it is a sacrifice of something to someone. And I think that we ought to mature ourselves as best we can by reading, by studying God's Word, by listening to what your pastor says to you. So that we can know the difference between what is true and what is not, and we can adjust our life accordingly so that we are not making provision for things that are in the flesh, in the carnal nature, in your carnal realm, in the things that are going to continually pull you away from the Spirit of God. But so that you can make provision for the spirit man that lives in you. So that you can make provision for the new creation in Christ that you actually are. And then you will begin to do the acceptable, good, and perfect will of God. You can't worship Jesus with your anxiety. You can only give it to him. And here's what's cool. It's the act of giving Jesus anything that becomes worship. Just think about that for a minute. Do you understand that when you give Jesus your sin, it's an expression of worship? As crappy as a sacrifice as that is. I mean, that's a horrible sacrifice. Right, right, Tessa? Like, if I came to Tessa and said, Tessa, you know, I've thought you were a horrible person, and I've in my mind I've just sinned against you again and again because I thought you were just mean and nasty and terrible. And I confess that to Tessa. That's a horrible offering. But when I turn to Jesus and say those exact same things, it becomes an expression of my desperate need for him, for his power, his grace, his mercy to be manifested in my life. And so what was horrible can become something that is the perfect sacrifice for Jesus. Why? Because it's in the act of giving to him. I want to teach you an exercise. Just say these words. Take a minute. Take a minute. John Eldridge wrote a book a few months ago. It's called Get Your Life Back. I recommend you read it. It's really good. Um, and he, he practices this, and I've started practicing it again uh, just because it has great language around it now. <laughs> but it's something I've done before, and maybe you have too. Whenever you encounter stress, difficulty, pain, here's what I want you to do. Take your, take your phone out. This is how you make an idol not an idol. You make it serve the Holy Spirit. Set the one-minute timer on your phone and hit start. And then whatever that issue is, say, Jesus, I'm giving you this issue. And then say it again. Jesus, I'm giving you this issue. Jesus, I'm giving you my anger. Jesus, I'm giving you my anxiety. Jesus, I'm so afraid right now, I'm, I'm, so I'm giving you my fear. What was destructive in your life will become an expression of worship, but it will also become your freedom. And it really works, guys. It really works. Sometimes five minutes later, you're gonna have to hit the timer again. But that's because you need to practice giving things to Jesus. 
you want to be on the worship team to, to serve him with the expression of guitar playing, you have to practice. You have to discipline yourself. You want to, you pick. How do you want to worship Jesus? Give to him is the expression. Give it to him. Your brokenness, your pain, your thanks, your praise. Give it to him. It's an expression of worship when you give it to him. I want to invite you to take a moment this morning, a one minute pause. And maybe you're dealing with something heavy in your heart. Maybe you're frustrated. Maybe you are beyond expression when it comes to the things that are bothering you. I want you to know this morning, if you become a practitioner of taking that minute and learning to give things to him, you'll get good at it. Just take a minute. Just take a minute this morning. Somebody here has given something to Jesus today, and I want you to know it's it's a step to freedom. It's a step to worship. It's a step to a new expression of how you can do things with God. It doesn't matter if you're here in person or if you're joining us online today. You, you can take a minute and you can learn to give it to him so that it becomes an expression of worship. As you declutter your life by a method like this, you leave room for the Holy Spirit to speak a true identity into you. Let's pray our prayer. The liturgy of Generations Church is summed up in this. Holy Spirit, what do you want me to do with what I've heard today? And God, I just lift each person here and online before you right now. As we ask this question, Holy Spirit, what do you want to say to me? What do you want me to take away? What do you want me to do with what I've heard? Lord, we want to be obedient to your voice. We want to become more perfect at hearing your voice. We want to know what to do, how to respond to the times we're in, God. We need to hear your voice. And so we lay us down. Broken, messy, half destroyed, half together. To let that be what we can give to you today. Thank you, Lord. I trust that God's speaking to you. You might not have a relationship with God today because you are not a follower of Jesus. I want you to know how simple this is to do. Expression of your will, the expression of you bending a knee to Jesus is what it takes. And there's something powerful and spiritual that happens. And we would love to walk with you in that process. The process of becoming is the disciple-making process. And so we'd love for you to come forward. We'd love to pray with you if you want to make a decision today. Maybe you're here, you have sickness in your body, you have a marriage that's in trouble, you have kids that don't listen and you're at your wit's end. We got lovely people who will mask up and stand with you for 14 minutes and 59 seconds to pray. Because <laughs> 15 is the magical number. But don't let it stop you. Don't, don't let fear stop you from receiving today. Whether it's fear of a virus or fear <sighs> having to let go of something that makes you look uncontrolled. We're going to sing together. Father, I pray that you would give courage to every heart right now that needs to respond to what you've said today, Jesus. Amen. <laughs>